Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today we're going to keep going with this series with Ian Juby talking about the evidence for the global flood. Now, yesterday, Ian ended with like this uh, example from the Joggins Formation in Nova Scotia and talking about how there's tens of thousands of feet of tree trunks uh, in various layers that have been squished. And we're talking like three feet uh, in diameter trunks that are squished to about six inches. Uh, it would take a lot of weight to do something like that. Now, these uh, tree trunks had to have been soft when they were squished. Uh, some of them are coal and some of them are petrified. All right, Either way you look at it, p- uh, coal or petrified, had they been squished after the fact, they would have fractured. But no, they were squished, squished in such a way that they didn't fracture. Interesting. They were also squished in, uh, well, they had to have been in dirt. They were also squished before the dirt became rock. All right, so this had to have happened all at once. And we're looking at tens of thousands of feet of sediment with layers of these polystrate, as in many strata, these chunks of of trees, these uh, logs and tree trunks that are passing between different layers that supposedly take thousands to millions of years to form, and they're squished like this, interconnected for tens of thousands of feet. Oh my goodness, can you say evidence for a massive, massive flood? And so today I'm going to start by backing up a hair. Just so you can hear Ian Juby say this again. Let this sink in. <laughs> this this really blew me away. I mean, I had to li- listen to it a few times myself. I'm going, oh my goodness, how does that even happen without a global flood? And so with that, let's go ahead and jump right in, continuing on pretty much where we left off yesterday. Three foot diameter trunks that have been squished down to about six inches in thickness under, I mean, now think about that. Try and squish like a two by four. Man. It's, it takes an unbelievable amount of pressure. So we're not talking, you know, a few hundred feet of dirt. We're talking like a mountain of dirt, probably thousands of feet of sediments were piled on top of these logs before they turned to rock because they had been squished as a log, before any part of them had turned to coal, uh, they're actually uh, petrified trees now, the trees themselves. So before they turned to rock, before the dirt turned to rock. So what on earth is going to pile thousands of feet of dirt on top of these things in a real big hurry? Well, clearly a typical small rainstorm. Yes, yes. (laughs) Like we see every day, yes. (laughs) Over millions of years. That's right. Now, the thing is, if you go up, say, 200 feet in the rock layers, okay, so these rock layers are all piled on top of each other. In fact, the job is quite dramatic. It's about 20,000 feet, vertical feet, worth of rock layers that are piled up there. Oh, wow. So the thing is, if you start at the bottom and go, okay, here's a fossil tree that's been squished. So therefore, we can deduce there's been at least, say, three or 400 feet worth of dirt piled on top of that log in order to do that. All that happened, had to have happened quickly before the, before the log rotted, before the log turned to fossil, before the dirt turned to rock, etc. So now you go up 300 feet vertically in the rock layers. Well, wait a minute. 250 feet above those, we find another layer of squished logs, which were also rapidly buried and also rapidly squished. And that took through mm-hmm. another 300 feet of dirt. So now you go up another 250 feet. Oh, look, more squished logs. And the entire Joggins Fossil Cliffs is like this. It's oh. it's un, unbelievable numbers of fossil trees, uh, the upright lycopods, which aren't trees. They're actually giant hollow reeds. Um, and so you can start to see what I'm getting at here. Basically, it ties in tens of thousands of feet of sediments all into one event that had to have happened quickly before the logs rotted, before the logs turned to fossils, before the dirt became rock, which it now is today. 
So it all, how on earth do you get, you know, even 10,000 vertical feet of sediments buried in a real big hurry? Well, there's only one way, a gigantic global scale flood. That's the only way. And that's where we're brought back to the Bible. Yep. And it's interesting, too, because a lot of Christians don't realize, um, you know, a lot of Christians, and I, I mean no criticism, because I guess I never thought about it until someone asked me, but uh, many Christians would just think that, well, yeah, maybe Noah's flood wasn't actually a worldwide flood. Maybe mm-hmm. it was just, uh, you know, a local flood and, sure. you know, stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, maybe evolution did happen. Maybe God used evolution. Okay, fair enough, and let's take those into account. Well, when we take a look at the words of Christ, Jesus talked about Adam and Eve as real people. The Garden of Eden as a real place. He said, in the beginning, God made them male and female. Mm -hmm. Uh, Adam and Eve were real people. And, in fact, he quoted Adam when he said, you know, the two shall become one flesh. Now, this man, the man shall leave his mother and father, and the two shall become one flesh. He was actually quoting Adam, who was talking about Eve. So, to Jesus, this was literal history. This was not allegory. This was literal history. And it was the same with Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the end of the times. And he was talking about Noah as a real person. The worldwide flood was a judgment upon the world. This wasn't a local flood. Um, and also, you get into the issue of, of, well, wait a minute, if it was a local flood, Noah had 120 years warning. Why did he spend 120 years of his life building this 450-foot-long ship, collecting two of every animal, when all he had to do to escape the flood was climb the nearest hill? <laughs> he had 120, you realize how far you can travel in 120 years? <laughs> it's unreal. I mean, think about it. Ten miles a day, which is nothing. Uh, you know, right. any one of our viewers could walk ten miles in a day. <laughs> and why would and why gather all the animals into the ark yeah. either? I mean, if it's just a local flood. Yeah, exactly. Amen. In, in your video, you uh, depict the other side of the story. If it was a local flood, in one of your videos, uh, it's kind of humorous because I've always thought about this. Okay, if it was a local flood and the water covered the highest hills, mm-hmm. that would have to be a miracle too. And you've got this image of this circular wall of water surrounding Noah's area, uh, and the rest of the land is dry, and there's just this wall of water submerging all of the mountains around there. Uh, it, either way, yeah, you're looking at a miracle uh, of biblical proportions. Yep, in either case. But again, why, why in the world would God say he's judging the world and then just flood a small area? Why would Noah build an ark? Why would he rescue all the animals? It just makes sense that there's a global flood going on here. And it also explains how those layers, those that geologic column, mm-hmm. got there. Yep. And in fact, uh, what the, the people who believe in deep time, they run into multiple, qu- multiple problems that we really don't have when they look at like this geologic column you're talking about. We see it in the textbooks. We see it in museums. Everyone's seen pictures of it with, you know, the simplest life form on the bottom and, you know, the more complex life forms like humans at the top. Sure. Well, that geologic column does not exist. It exists in only two places on planet Earth, and we just mentioned them, textbooks and museums. That's the only place on planet Earth those geologic columns exist. In fact, in North America alone we find hundreds of locations where the order of those rock layers, the evolutionary order, is reversed. It's all topsy-turvy, as there's several uh, just in Banff National Park alone and in Jasper National Park here in Canada. Uh, There's several in uh, the Glacier National Park in Montana in the U.S., um, how, how, how do evolutionists, geologists account for that? Do, do they just invoke uplift and call it good? Uh, sort of. What they do is they, they propose that um, the older rock layers slid up over top of the younger ones. And hmm. this happened during mountain formation. Now, there's many, many, many problems with that. Uh, first of all, the physics. Um, anyone who's ever tried to move a fridge or something heavy knows that knows, understands the physics by first-hand experience. If you go to move a fridge, um, it takes less force to keep the fridge moving 
than it does to first start it moving. And that's why people will to get something heavy moving across the floor, sliding across the floor, they'll give it a good hard shove, and that's to break the static friction, the standing friction. And so um, what happens is when if now you're going to th- shove a thousand foot thick layer of rock over top of another one, the uh, the amount of friction is just absolutely astounding when you start doing the physics and the math. It's it's astonishing. And so the amount of force required to move it would uh, is far greater than the amount of force it takes to keep it moving. So if you can picture this, all this force builds up. There's like, you know, the continents are moving, okay? And, and there's this force that's being applied to this mountain of rock trying to shove it up over top of the other one. And it, it's pushing and pushing harder and harder and harder. Finally, it breaks the friction and starts moving. When it does that, because the force that's, there's a spring tension there, even in solid rock, the force involved is so great that the rocks will, will move in huge jumps, because now the force that's applied to them is more than enough to keep it moving. And so, two things will happen. Number one, if you move a thousand foot thick layer of rock over top of another one, you will melt the rock. Uh, if you push your hand down on a table and slide your hand across the table, you will feel the heat from the friction. Yeah. Well, moving a thousand foot thick layer of rock and, and in uh, Castle Mountain in uh, Banff National Park is 2,000 feet of limestone that slid up over top of an older shale, allegedly. Uh, I don't believe that, <clears throat> but that's what they claim. Um, well, start doing the math. I mean, if you're a hand, you can feel the temperature rise. You can imagine how much the temperature is going to rise if it's, uh, the weight of a thousand feet or two thousand feet of rock on top of your hand. <laughs> it's the heat produced is just astronomical and it will melt the rock. Well, there's no evidence of the rock melting at the contact. I've gone and studied the contacts of several of these overthrusts. It's not there. Secondly, once the rock slides over top of the other, you will get these sliding scratch marks, which of course makes total sense, right? Well, they have a technical term for that. It's called slick and sides. That's what they call the scratch marks. And, again, I've actually gone to uh, eight, eight of these sites, locations now in North America, where they claim the rock slid over to the top of the other. Um, every single one of them was missing these sliding marks. Hmm. Now, two of those locations um, actually had sort of kind of evidence that might indicate the rock slid against each other. But the fact that there was no slick insides, even in areas, tells you that the whole thing didn't slide. So I've got a huge problem with that. The evidence just doesn't line up with it. Now, if it's a worldwide flood making these layers, there is no sliding involved. The layers were just laid down in the order they were laid down in. Um, You know, there could be a cyclic nature because the the waves uh, coming in and out, tidal waves, for example, you're going to have tidal axis during a worldwide flood. So you're going to get cycles of, of deposition, which could involve cycles of deposition of different rocks, uh, different dirt, which turns into different rocks. So none of this is an issue for world, explaining it within the context of a worldwide flood. Hmm. That was very awesome. Technical. I'm sorry. No, that was great. That was great. Okay, um, changing gears here. One of the most, uh, I don't know, touted examples of a worldwide flood, so we might as well start with this, um, is aquatic, you know, sea life uh, fossils right. at the tops of the highest mountains on Earth. Uh, in fact, here in Colorado, I'm in northern Colorado, we're over a mile high, yep. and we're right at the base of the foothills, and in my backyard, I can, while I'm digging up my tomato plants or whatever, messing around in the garden, I'll find clams that have been fossilized, and they're closed. Now, according to Ken Hovind's uh, creation series, mm-hmm. he mentions that clams, uh, when, they're, when they die, they open up. That muscle relaxes and they open up. But I'm finding them fossilized in the closed position in Colorado. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, what say you concerning these sea life fossils at the top of mountains? Yeah, well, there's, there's a lot to say, especially about the clams. Um, <laughs> There's actually two sort of categories of clams. Some that uh, 
like you mentioned, um, open up when they when they die. And those are the clams that, that the mussel holds the clam shell closed. There are a, another kind where they actually have a hole in the bottom shell, and it's cantilevered. Oh. And there's a mussel that comes, or there's a tendon that sort of comes out of that hole and is attached to the top top shell on the outside, and it pulls the shell open. So oh, you've wow. you got to be careful to... to um, Look for that and make sure. But but here's the thing. I've found, I've looked at huge deposits. I want to go back and study deposits because I, I realized something after the fact. The ones that pull themselves open, they will tend to open up in a flood or when they die. Or, or, sorry, they tend to stay closed <laughs> when they die. But in a okay. catastrophe, they will tend to get ripped apart, fly open, etc. Um, so you can find deposits which are nothing but half of clamshells. So I'm curious. I have not been able to go in and look into this yet, but uh, I'm suspicious that sort of what we call the, the hash layers, which is just a, a hash of broken, smashed clam fossils. Literally, it's just compacted all together into a rock now. Um, well, that, that's a lot of what I find. Okay. Um, it, it, some of it's mashed together, and then you'll find others that are just by themselves. Right. Okay. Well, the ones that are all mashed apart, and I suspect those are the kinds that actually pull themselves open, and they've actually been ripped apart, and that's what you're finding is all these half a clamshells, whereas the ones that are buried closed were the ones that pull themselves closed and were, in fact, buried alive. And so uh, at least all the ones that I found that were buried in the closed position were all the kind that pulled themselves closed. So therefore, they were buried alive. And I found those all over the place, in Ontario, Texas, Oklahoma. I mean, my goodness, they're all over the place. Um, I've heard of people finding them in Colorado. I've never seen them in Colorado, but I'm, I have no doubt that they're there. Um, but here's the thing. When we, where we find these, as you mentioned, you know, you're – you know, the mile high state, right? <laughs> it's not just there. Every major mountain range on planet Earth has fossilized sea life on it. The Himalayas, the Rockies, the Appalachians, you name it, it has fossil sea life on it. In fact, that is what geologists look for in order to identify a volcano. If it does not have fossil sea life on it, it is assumed to be a volcano which erupted after the mountains formed and thus has no fossil sea life on it. Huh. So every major mountain range, every major mountain has fossil sea life, including Mount Everest. Uh, the first guy to climb Mount Everest, I've forgotten his name right now. Uh, I, I couldn't tell you either. You forgot it? Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. He, uh, we had we had his tents at the summer science camp that I worked at. They were awful. Uh, <laughs> uh, he uh, when he climbed Everest, he documented that the top three thousand feet of Mount Everest was covered in fossil clam shells in the closed position. So these were fossil clams that were buried alive. And so when when I say we're buried alive, we're not kidding here. Um, clams can burrow themselves out of unbelievable depths, and this is a rather cruel experiment that some scientists did, but they, they took living clams, buried them to see how deep they could dig themselves out. And they were get up, able to get as deep as 30 feet, about 10 meters of dirt on top of these clams, and the clams could still burrow out, but the problem was they would run out of oxygen and die trying to dig their way out. And so that gives you an idea of just what kind of event buries these clams together. You know, okay. in the closed position, they were buried alive. And now to find them on the top of Mount Everest. Now, here's the thing. Um, even the evolutionary geologists will say, well, yes, but those layers were laid down in the ocean and then were uplifted into the mountain ranges we have now. I totally agree. Totally agree. Here's the thing. Those layers also go on to every single continent. So if you follow the layers, and it covers the entire continent, what does that tell you? It tells you that the entire continent was underwater at the time those layers were formed. Well, what is that? Uh -huh. That's called a worldwide flood. Wow. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. Ian Juby is, wow, he is a powerhouse of information. This is awesome. Uh, friends, if you like these podcasts, if you like this type of material, please share this. I urge you to share this out on whatever social media platforms you guys subscribe to. 
be it Facebook, Google+, Twitter, whatever. Share it with your friends. Let's get this information out. Let's get our fellow believers equipped, and let's get some people saved. And with that, I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.